You're listening to the soothing sounds of the 2023 Epiphone Casino. After this, coffee with a Bach. In the meantime, let's talk about this here guitar. So I've always loved the Casino and the 330. Not just Beatles, but yeah, Beatles. And I've been wanting a guitar with some P90s, so I got a good opportunity to get this guitar at an outstanding price, basically cost. I'm really pleased with it overall. Unlike previous years of the less expensive casinos, the sides and back are no longer badly sunbursted. They have that pretty dark reddish brown. And the neck also is not black. It's the same color. The neck is a little bit thinner than I would prefer. I was hoping when they said Slim 60s that it'd be like the uh, neck on my SG, which is small for me, but perfect. This one's a good bit thinner and also a little bit flatter in profile, kind of a flatter D, which is okay. Let's cover the good, the bad, and the ugly in this. Let's start with the tuners. The tuners are fairly generic Klusen copies, and they work really well. The only thing I'd say is, you know, learn how to wind the strings, and all the screws were loose as it came from the factory. I had to tighten them all up. But no issue with tuning stability, and I like the look. Next up, the nut slots were both way high as far as the, the string height and really deep in the nut. The nut's a graph tech. So I went in with my set of nut files and lowered all the string heights so that all the strings were exactly the right height and uh, would not go sharp in the first three to five fret positions in a guitar which is otherwise perfectly intonated. This is a PRS DGT SE that came in and in stock form, its string slots were also a good bit high. This is a Yamaha Revstar in the same price range and from the factory, it was almost perfect. I went and lowered them a little bit, but it was much closer. I then removed all the excess material from the top. I could remove a bit more here to get it perfect, but eventually I'm going to get a bone nut on this. So for now, I'm happy with it. And I also smoothed off the, uh, you know, gave it some curves and smoothed off all the square edges that were a little bit uncomfortable to the hand. The frets overall are pretty good on this guitar. You can feel the fret ends. They're not perfectly round, but they're not sharp and they're fairly even. No real problem with high or low fret spots, though it's not perfect. The new guitars have Indian Laurel fretboards, which are you know more attractive than some other brands like the Squire that uses it, but you know, it's not rosewood. What you see, I've added some fretboard oil, which helps. This one has a, a, a burl there that you can see at the eighth fret. Uh, you know, it doesn't change the feel or the sound, but if it bothers you, look out for that. The inlays, however, are just slightly below the surface of the fretboard, meaning that they were sunk in rather than left a little bit high and then sanded like you do in a better guitar. If you drag your nail across them, you'll feel that they're a little bit low compared to the plane of the fingerboard, but it doesn't seem to affect string bending or, or any playing feedback. The DGT I had had much better frets with really nice fret ends, but they didn't do a good job on the uh, fretboard finishing there and a lot of rough marks. I don't know how this guitar made it through PRS's QA process, but they took it back and they're going to fix that. The PRS does have rosewood though in the same price point, as does this Yamaha Revstar, which not only has rosewood at the same price point, but has really, really well done stainless steel frets. So between the three guitars at this price point, the PRS SE, the Casino, and the Revstar, I think the Casino has to come in dead last the PRS right in the middle, though the particular example I had was actually worse than the Casino. And the Yamaha Revstar is just leading the entire pack at this price range. This is the stock bridge, and uh, it had the uh, problem almost all ABRs have with the wire rattling. I tried some clear nail polish. That helped that, but there was a bigger issue. The notches in the saddles were so deep on the wound strings that it throws the entire radius off, so lower on the bass side than the treble side. Now, Epiphone are marketing their new bridge as tone lock. What that means is that the uh, there are some little springs there inside the hole, which grab onto the, to the Nashville-style stud there. So if you change strings, it doesn't fall off, which is nice, but... Uh, there's some play with the uh, Nashville thing in the in the insert of the body, and then the bridge has some play on top of that. A couple of that with the saddles. No, you know, you could replace saddles. I just decided to change it all out. So I wanted to go to a true ABR as opposed to the Nashville because I happen to have a, a spare true ABR bridge here. So I found these conversion posts from Philadelphia Luthier Supply. 
I'll have a link in the description. $9 a pair, nickel, no brainer. So it goes into the metric Nashville insert in the body and then gives you 632 upper portions for a standard ABR to go into. Very nice solution. If you prefer, you can just change out the saddles or you can get a different metric bridge. There's lots of options out there. But I happen to have a spare Faber bridge that was left over from my Les Paul, which I sold and kept the Faber bridge handy. And it's, it's just great. No issues whatsoever. Intonates perfectly, follows the radius perfectly, and it locks on even better than the uh, Epiphone. The stock knobs are quite nice, which has not always been the case with Epiphones. It has the little indicators that people like to call bleeders. They're not pointed, and I quite like them. No bleeding here. But I had a big issue with the output jack. The uh, stock jack is really cheap, and it was cross-threaded, by which I mean the nut was on at an angle and it could not be tightened. And when I did remove the nut to be able to put it back on, I noticed that there was no toothed washer and the nut just wanted to spin in the body. There's a toothed washer if you don't know what that is. Another issue with the stock jack is that it has a short bushing, so you cannot use a toothed washer with it. So there's no way to really get the jack tight. So I replaced it with a long bushing switchcraft, which meant I had to pull everything out of the body. In fairness, the PRS and the Yamaha also use cheap jacks, but they use long bushing jacks. You can see the additional nut there. And they do use toothed washers, though the Yamaha uses a very flimsy one. On the client's Yamaha, I also changed it out for a switchcraft. But keep this in mind, on the PRS and the Yamaha, most users could tighten or replace the jack very easily because they're on little plates mounted to the side belt. On a hollow body guitar, it's more than most users can do and it can be expensive to have done. I'm fortunate enough to do this for a living, so I just did it. While I had everything out, I discovered that all the pots were 500k CTS, good, 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 but they're a linear taper. And that's subjective when it comes to volume pots and how those work. But I hate, hate, hate linear taper pots for tones. It moves all the useful range down between zero and two. So while I had everything out, I changed them out for some Mojo Tone Vintage Taper made by CTS 500K Audios. Also worth pointing out that the stock pots did not have a toothed washer so they could spin around. So they weren't really tight and they could have spun around and broken wires, which happens all the time with the guitars in this price range. When the guitar came to me, the neck pickup was very intermittent. Mostly it wouldn't work. And uh, I didn't like the feel of the switch at all, so I did change the switch out to a switchcraft. But first, I fixed the neck pickup. You can see here how these switches are made. There are two little tabs there from each side of the switch, which are supposed to be soldered together. That's your output wire. On this one, the output wire was fully soldered to the lug, which is attached to the bridge pickup. But the one from the neck pickup was just pressed in place. It had no solder on it. So you can see here, before I changed it, I did re-solder it and made the neck pickup work 100% of the time. So that's an easy fix if yours has that issue. But I just didn't care for the feel of the switch. It's very clunky and it yeah, comes up off the guitar a lot. And I put in a nice switchcraft. A note on that, while the jack and pot holes were the right diameter for CTS and switchcraft parts, the hole in the body for the switch did have to be reamed out. For me, it's not that big a deal. For most people in this price range, needing to have this done or wanting to have this done can be a little bit pricey. And so you don't think I'm just slamming Epiphone. The switch on this PRS SE was pretty much the exact same switch, and I didn't care for its feel either. This is the wiring of that PRS SE, and as it came in, the metal braided cables were shorting out the wires and connections right there on the push-pull pot used for the coil splitting. So there's how to fix that. Some tape would be nice. And this is the inside of the Yamaha. And aside from the very nice switch in there, it's a super switch, the pots are actually not as good as the ones that come stock in this Epiphone, but it was wired better. So after all of that, well, a few other little things I want to touch on before you get to hear it. It's a good looking guitar. Some changes they've made. The finish around the F-holes is much, much better than in previous years. And they went to nickel plating on the P90s, which is a nice touch. After all that, you know, it plays really well. The action's good. The pickups don't sound that great. And I'm not talking about the... 60 cycle hum, but it certainly has that. Especially since I'm sitting so close to the amp in this shot. The pickups don't sound great. They're very hot. They're very compressed. They're very dark. They sound pretty good when you hear them by themselves, but these just don't quite sit right.
it can be a really hard, grainy attack. And don't get me wrong, I'm not being a snob. You can get good sounds out of the stock pickups, but they're not giving the sounds I'm looking for. So I'm going to put some Freelands in here, not just because Lindy's a great guy and makes great pickups, but he also makes a version with nickel-plated dog ears, which is what I really want. Sorry, Lawler. <laughs> You know, objectively, this is not a very versatile or even a very good guitar, but brains are funny. We like what we like. And I have a feeling that most of you watching this video came into this either liking or disliking the casino. And I doubt anything I've said here has changed anyone's mind. If you are considering buying one, I think I've given you a, a good overview of the strengths and weaknesses and what to expect. And that's about all I can do. We like what we like.